Ramayana. Translated into English prose from the original Sanskrit of Valmiki. Edited and published by Manmatha Nath 1891. Ramayana. Ayodhya Kandam. Section 21. At this time Lakshmana, sorely distressed, addressed the weeping Kusalya, the mother of Rama with the following words suitable to that occasion. I like it not, O worshipful one, that Raghava should repair unto the forest, renouncing this grandeur of sovereignty. The king is axorious, old and therefore of perverted judgment and is addicted to worldly affairs. Being under the influence of his wife and passion, what could he not speak? I do not see any such fault or sin in Rama that he should be banished from the kingdom to range in the wood. I do not find any such man in this world, even amongst great enemies, who, forsaken for heinous sins, can cite, even in his absence, any fault of him. Observing what law of righteousness does the monarch, without any cause, renounce such a son who is like unto celestials, simple, well-disciplined and beloved even of the enemies. What son, remembering his father's conduct, shall carry in his heart these words of the king, who has again gone back to childhood? Array people come to know this proposal of exile, do thou secure the government of the kingdom unto thyself with me? Who can disturb the installation, or Raghava, myself protecting thee by thy side with my bows, like unto death himself? If anybody stands here as an enemy, surely shall I, O best of men, depopulate the whole city of Ayodhya with sharp arrows. I shall immolate all who shall stand by Bharatha or wish him well, Certainly mildness brings about discomfiture. If father being propitiated and excited by Kakei, turns out to be our enemy, he shall be slain, without any hesitation. Even a spiritual leader deserves chastisement if he is puffed up with pride, and is devoid of the power of judging good actions and bad, and when he is gone astray. Tell me, O best of men, by what law of virtue and what reason does he purpose to confer this kingdom upon Kakei, which has devolved upon thee by the law of inheritance? Who dares conferring on Bharatha the kingdom, carrying hostility with me and thee? O worshipful one, verily am I attached at heart to my brother? By truth, bow, gifts and things dear unto me, do I swear unto thee? If Rama shall enter into the wood, know me, O worshipful one, to have entered into the fire before that. Like unto the sun dispelling darkness, shall I remove thy sorrow by dint of my power. May your worshipful self and Raghava witness it. Readily shall I dispatch my father, whose heart is unduly attached unto Kakei and who is therefore while and being old contemptibly playing the child. Hearing these words of the high-souled Lakshmana, Kusalya weeping and being pressed with sorrow spoke these words unto Rama. You have heard, O my son, what your brother Lakshmana said, and if you like, do what seems reasonable unto thee. It does not behove thee, hearing the sinful words given went to by the co-wife, to repair hence, leaving me who is so distressed with sorrow. O thou pious one, having knowledge of religion, if do thou wish to acquire righteousness, serve me here and continue practicing the best of all virtues. Here, O my son, the great ascetic Kasyapa, lived in his house, serving his mother continually and being crowned with best moral merit reached heaven. As the monarch is worshipful unto thee in veneration so am I. I do not permit thee to repair hence unto the forest. Separated from thee I do not need life or happiness, with thee I would prefer faring on grass. If do thou depart unto the forest leaving me troubled with sorrow, 
I shall resort to the vow of fasting and shall not be able to sustain my life. And then thou shalt receive the penalty of hell, well known to the people, as did the ocean, the lord of rivers, for like, unrighteousness, suffer the agony of Brahmini side. Whereupon unto his mother Kuesalya, sorrowful and weeping, spoke Rama, virtuous soul, these words of righteousness. There is no power in me to transgress my father's behests, bend low I my head unto thee, I want to proceed to the forest. The learned Rishi Kandu, who lived in the forest keeping the word of his father, killed a cow, knowing it to be unrighteousness. In our line the descendants of Sagra, at the command of their father, met with signal destruction, while digging the earth. Rama, the son of Jamdagni, at his father's words, decapitated his mother in the forest. These and other godlike personages, O worshipful one, obeyed heroically the orders of their father, and I shall do my father's welfare therefore. It is not I alone who am carriage nagged out my father's commands, those whom I have mentioned now, O worshipful one, have done so. I am not introducing some such righteousness, unfavorable unto thee, that has been never practiced before. I am simply treading the path, that has been upheld and followed by worthies gone before. Surely shall I accomplish that which is worthy of being performed in this world and nothing else, one going by his father's behests is not certainly degraded. Saying these words unto his mother, that best of men worst in speech and best of archers, again spoke unto Lakshmana all these words. I know full well, O Lakshmana, thy affection towards me and thy power, strength and unconquerable force. Not knowing my settled conviction in regard to truth and peace, my mother, O beautiful Lakshmana, is so disturbed with incomparable sorrow. Righteousness is the prime object in this world and in righteousness is established truth, and this excellent utterance of my father is in keeping with righteousness. It does not become them, O hero, who abide in righteousness to fail to carry out the commands of father, mother or a Brahman. While I have been, O warrior, ordered by Kakei at my father's words, I shall not be able to transgress those behests again. Do thou relinquish therefore this unrighteous purpose of thine consequent to the virtues of the Kshatriyas, do thou abide by righteousness but not cruelty, and follow my decision. Saying these words unto Lakshmana out of fraternal affection, spoke again Rama to Kuesalya with clasped hands and with his head bending low, I do bind thee with an oath of my life, O venerable one, to allow me to wander away hence into the wood. Do thou perform benedictory ceremonies for my welfare. Like unto the royal saint Yayati, in the days of your once falling on earth going again to the abode of celestials, I shall, fulfilling my woes, again return home from the forest. Do thou, O mother, Assuage thy grief within thy heart, lament not thou, I shall return home again from the wood after making good my father's words. Myself, Lakshmana, Vadehi, Sumitra and thyself shall abide by father's words, and this is the virtue eternal. Desisting from the ceremonies of installation and allaying thy sorrow in thy heart do thou, O my mother, Follow my pious decision about retiring to the forest. Hearing those pious, sober and reasonable words of Rama, the venerable mother, regaining her sense like unto the dead, and casting her look upon him, spoke to him again the following words. I am equally worshipful unto thee, O my son, with your father, for like him have I brought thee up with pains, and like him do I love thee. I shall not allow thee to repair unto the forest, and it does not behove thee to go leaving me behind sore distressed with grief. Without thee, 
of what avail to me is my life, my relatives, the worship of the mains and the deities and the knowledge of divine truth on this earth. Prefer do I thy company even for a moment to the presence of all creation. Hearing these sorrowful words of his mother, Rama was again inflamed with ire, like unto an elephant goaded with a firebrand, when entering into darkness. He, abiding in righteousness, spoke such pious words unto his mother, almost insensible, and unto the son of Sumitra, bewailing and racked with sorrow, as he was justified to utter on that occasion. I know, O Lakshmana, thy deep respects unto me and thy power. It is not proper for thee to pain me along with my mother, not being cognizant of my intention. Righteousness, wealth, and the objects of desire are looked upon with great esteem in this world of the created, but when the occasion for obtaining the result consequent upon the virtuous deeds of a prior life appears, all these three, I have no doubt, are fulfilled in righteousness, as the wife alone, obedient, charming and having a son fulfills them all. It is not becoming for us to perform all those things where these three do not combine, whence results righteousness that we should resort to. A man seeking wealth becomes despicable, and one subject to desires is not admired by any, when bereft of righteousness. Who of us, having no tendency to wickedness, shall not obey the command of our father, knowing it to be righteousness, who is old, our monarch and preceptor in military training, be it an outcome of his desires, anger or joy. For this it is that I am unable to act against my father's vow, he is our father and therefore can command us both like a master, and he is the husband of this venerable one, therefore her stay and righteousness itself. The righteous monarch is still living and continues in his own path when ready to redeem his vow even by renouncing me. How can this worshipful one accompany me like other insignificant widows? Do thou permit me therefore, to repair unto the forest and perform benedictory ceremonies for me so that I may again return home like unto Yajeti regaining heaven by truth. I cannot neglect eminent fame being impelled by avarice for kingdom alone. Life is but of short duration, O worshipful one, and as such I do not long for acquiring this nether earth by means unrighteous. Rama, that for most of men, with a view to range into the forest Dandaka after patiently propitiating his mother and instructing fully his younger brother the mysteries of righteousness, went round his mother with reverence and made up his mind to repair unto the forest. Section 22 Hereafter, holding the equanimity of mind with patience self-possessed Rama spoke thus unto the son of Sumitra, his dear brother, and friend, who was greatly sorry, had lost his patience and was pressed down with this misfortune of Rama, and had his eyes inflated with anger, like unto an infuriated elephant, subduing this anger and sorrow, taking recourse to patience only, brooking the insult and resorting to joy. Do thou set aside all those things that have been collected here for my installation and make preparations speedily for my repairing to the forest. O son of Sumitra, do thou take that amount of trouble for preventing now the collection of materials for installation, as didst thou take beforehand for collecting them. Do thou act therefore in such a way as will remove the apprehension from the mind of our mother, Kakei, who is troubled at heart so greatly on hearing of my installation. O son of Sumitra, I cannot neglect for a moment the trouble that has arisen in her mind on account of this fear. I do not remember to have done on any occasion willfully or unwillfully anything that is displeasing unto my father or mothers. 
My father is of truthful words and woes and he has been greatly terrified by the fear of the next world. May his fear disappear now. If this work of installation be not stopped, my father shall be greatly pained at heart thinking that his woes shall not be fulfilled and his sorrow will also at me. And it is for this reason, O Lakshmana, that I purpose speedily to retire from this city to the forest renouncing the preparations for my installation. On my wandering away unto the forest today, the daughter of Kekya shall have her ends attained and shall install Bharatha on the throne without any disturbance whatsoever. Myself going to the forest, wearing bark, tiger skin and matted hair, Kakei shall attain the happiness of her mind. That great one, who has inspired Kakei with this mode of mind and has kept it firm, I cannot offend. I shall repair hence without any delay. Do thou regard, O Lakshmana, destiny as the only cause of this transfer of the kingdom, although attained, and of my banishment. Had not destiny been instrumental in bringing about this determination in Kakei, she would not have been so much persevering in the infliction of misery upon me. Knowest thou, O gentle Lakshmana, that I have never made any distinction in my mind between my mothers, nor did Kakei make any such thing before between me and her son, consequently it is destiny only that has made her press for the prevention of my installation and for my exile with harsh and cruel words, or else why should she, a daughter of a king and possessed of an excellent temper and high accomplishments, speak painful words unto me in the presence of her husband like unto an ordinary woman? That which is above comprehension is destiny and it is beyond the power of creatures to avert its consequence, and evidently it is through this destiny that have sprung up this distemper of Kakeya and my loss of kingdom. What man dares withstand, O son of Sumitra, this terrible destiny hidden from our view until known by the consequences of action? Destiny is the prime source of those inconceivable causes which occur with reference to happiness, misery, fear, and anger, profit and loss, birth and deliverance. Seers of great austerity being influenced by this destiny succumb to the attack of anger and desire, renouncing all their hard disciplines. The hindrance in this world to the completion of works taken in hand, and the origination of an unthought of event in its stead is nothing but the action of this destiny. The mind brought under discipline by this true rationale, there remains no cause of sorrow regarding my installation being put a stop to. Do thou therefore assuage thy grief and follow me and intercept speedily the collection of materials for my installation. The bathing ceremony, necessary before taking the vows of asceticism, shall be performed, O Lakshmana, with all these jars full of water brought for my installation. Or what necessity have I with all these articles of installation? Water drawn from the well by myself shall do for entering into the vow of exile. Do thou not grieve, O Lakshmana, for this loss of kingdom. Of kingdom and exile into the forest, exile is fraught with glorious results. Knowest thou now the mighty power of destiny and do thou not blame therefore my younger mother and my father laboring under the influence of destiny. Section 23 Being addressed by Ramadas, Lakshmana, the mighty hero, hanging down his head with half reluctance, pondered for some time, and, placed midway between joy and grief, with frown drawing in between his brows, began to sob hot and hard, like unto an angry serpent in a cave belonging to another. Nobody could eye his face, having terrible frowns, which looked like that of an angry lion, moving the extremities of his hands like unto the trunk of an elephant, variously altering the altitude of the neck above his frame, 
glancing a look awry. Thus spoke he unto his brother, to avoid the transgression of righteousness, and the degradation of the people consequent upon a bad example, thou art eager to repair unto the forest. This thy eagerness is certainly misplaced. Wast not thou under error? How could one like thyself, being heroic among the Kshatriyas, and capable of overcoming destiny, speak in such a strain as behoves one that is important? Why dost thou extol destiny which is powerless and weak? For what reason dost thou not apprehend unrighteousness in those two, the Siratha and Kakei, addicted to vice? Dost thou not understand that there are many people who feign piety outwardly to deceive the simple? With a desire to renounce thee by fraud, they simulate piety which is but selfishness. Had they not purposed thus, O oh, Raghava, things would not have taken such a turn. If this story of the wars be true, then why had it not been declared before? Surely has the monarch engaged in an action hateful to the people, namely the installation of a younger brother neglecting thee, the eldest one. Pray, pardon me, O great hero, I cannot brook all this. Even that so-called virtue do I loathe, which has, O high-souled one, fascinated thee, and made thy mind run from one extreme to another. Why shalt thou, being capable of work, conform these impious and cursed words of thy father, who is sadly under the influence of Kakei. Here lies my sorrow that thou dost not admit that this disturbance of the installation has arisen out of the pretext of boon giving. Thy idea of virtue is indeed an object of censure. People will mark this thy forsaking of the kingdom for redeeming the woes of thy father with opprobrium. Who else, save thee, even thinks of compassing the desires of the monarch and the queen Kakei, who are of unrestrained habits, ever intent on our mischief and are our enemies known by the name of parents. Even if their throwing obstacles in the way of thy installation thou considerest, as the inevitable action of destiny, pray disregard it, that does not please me. He who is tremulous, weak and powerless, follows the track of destiny. They pay no regard to it who are mighty heroes and whose prowess is held in esteem by the people. He, who can avert the consequences of destiny by dint of his manliness, does not lose heart even in the face of his interest being endangered by it. People shall witness today the power of destiny and manliness, this day shall appear which of them is more powerful. Those who have witnessed before the prevention of thy installation by the evil agency of destiny, shall see it defeated, even this very day, by my manliness. Thwart shall I that assailing destiny by my prowess like unto a terrible elephant, freed of its shackles past the restraining power of a goading hook and inflamed with the juice issuing out of its temples. What of the father? Not even all the protectors of the regions nor the entire population of the three worlds shall be able to present any obstacle in the way of Rama's installation. Those who have, with one voice, O king, settled about thy exile unto the forest, shall be banished today for fourteen years. Burn shall I down that hope of my father and Kakei that they want to place Bharata on the throne by hindering thy installation. Influence of destiny shall not bring my opponents that amount of happiness, as the misery inflicted on them by my terrible prowess. Thyself retiring unto the forest after governing the people for a thousand years, Thy sons shall resume the administration. Dwelling into the forest is permitted after making over the charge of the subjects unto the hands of the sons, as did the Rajarshis of old. The monarch changing his mind, the kingdom shall be transferred into another's hands. Dost thou, being afraid of this, want to fly as an exile unto the forest?
and is it for this that thou o virtuous soul drama dost not wish to have kingdom for thee i do promise unto thee o great hero that i shall protect thy kingdom like unto shore protecting the sea or else i shall not attain to the region of heroes do thou perform the rites of installation with things necessary for benediction do thou engage in these affairs myself alone shall be able by force to thwart the opposition of the kings these hands of mine are not intended for enhancing the beauty of my body this bow is not meant for an ornament only this sword is not for binding woods together with and these arrows are not for carrying the weight of woods these four belonging to me are for the use of killing the enemies never do i desire that i shall not cut them into pieces with sharp edged swords brilliant as the lightning whom i do consider as my enemies though they be redoubtable as indra the wielder of thunderbolts cover thick shall i the field of battle and make it impassable by cutting asunder the trunks of the elephants thighs of the horses and heads of the infantry being beheaded by my swords like unto the flaming fire and besmeared with blood resembling the clouds with lightning my enemies shall fall down to the ground who is there proud of his own prowess that shall be able to withstand me when i shall appear at the battle field with bows and leathern fences of fingers killing one with a number of arrows and sometimes many with a single one i shall drive shafts into the vital organs of men horses and elephants today shall i display my skill in arms in destroying the supremacy of the monarch and establishing thine that hand which is fit for the smearing of the sandal for wearing armlets distributing wealth and maintaining relations shall be engaged today or rama in performing its worthy action the discomfiture of them who want to throw obstacles in the way of thy installation pray tell me now which of your enemies shall be cut off by me from wealth life and relatives i am thy servant Do thou give me instruction that the whole earth may be brought under thy subjection that descendant of ragu wiping tears of the eyes of lakshmana and consoling him repeatedly spoke unto him saying o gentle one i have thought it to be the best way by all means that i shall abide by my father's orders section 24 Seeing Rama determined upon carrying out his father's behests, Kesalya with her voice choked with vapor begot of tears, spoke unto him the following pious words: How shall this virtuous soul one, beloved of people and who has never experienced misfortune before, live on grains gleaned, being born of me to the sratha? How shall th- that Rama live upon fruits and roots? whose servants and attendants fare on well cooked rice who shall believe or believing who shall not be afraid that this highly accomplished descendant of kakutstha favorite of the king is going to be exiled certainly destiny who crowns or afflicts people with happiness or misery is the most powerful agency in the world or why shalt thou o pleasing rama fly as an exile unto the forest this great and incomparable fire of sorrow issuing from my mind inflamed by the wind of thy absence increased by the fuels of lamentation and pain kindled by hard sobs obtaining the oblations of tears vomiting the smoke of vapor begotten of anxious thoughts the result of counting upon the days of thy return shall consume me making greatly lean when deprived of thy presence as does the fire burn the dry grass in summer like unto a cow following its young one shall i follow thee o my darling wherever shalt thou go hearing those words of his mother rama that best of men spoke the following words unto her who was greatly troubled with sorrow the monarch has been duped by kakeyi 
myself resorting to the forest, surely shall he resign his life, if cast off again by thee. There is nothing more cruel for women than the forsaking of their husbands, it does not behove thee therefore, to think even of this opprobrious action. Do thou serve this descendant of Kakutstha, my father, and the lord of the earth as long as he lives know thou this to be the eternal virtue. Thus addressed by Rama, Kusalya of auspicious looks, being gratified greatly, spoke unto him, the remover of her sorrows. Truly it is. Rama, the foremost amongst religious men, being spoken thus, said to his mother, who was greatly disturbed with sorrow, again in the following strain. Proper it is both for thee and me to carry out father's words, he is thy husband, and my best preceptor and the lord and master of all people. With great pleasure shall I abide in thy words after passing these nine and five years in the great forest. Thus addressed, Kusalya, bearing great affection for her son, sorely pained and having her eyes full of tears, spoke unto her beloved son the following words. O Rama, I shall not be able to live amongst these cohives. If art thou resolved to go to the forest for the discharge of thy father's behest, do thou take me with thee, O Kakutstha, like unto a wild hind. Rama, suppressing his feeling, spoke unto his mother who was lamenting, thus, saying, Husband is the deity and master of the wife as long as she lives. So the monarch being the Lord can deal with thee and me in any way he likes. That highly intelligent Lord of men living, we should not consider ourselves as without a master. Bharata is also pious and beloved of all people in speech. He, intent on the performance of religious services, shall attend upon thee always. Do thou now take care that on my retiring, the monarch does not wear away by the pangs of my separation, that this terrible sorrow may not kill him. Do thou look after the welfare of the old king always. The woman, who serves not her husband, being engaged in excellent religious rites and fasts, shall fare wretchedly in the life to come, and a woman gets at the excellent abode of the celestials by serving her husband. Even those who do not worship and bow unto the celestials should serve their husbands alone being intent upon their welfare. Such is the virtue that should be always pursued by women according to the Vedas and Smritis. Do thou beguile thy time, O worshipful one, expecting my return, by worshipping the celestials with flowers and oblations unto the fire and serving well the Brahmans. Engaged in discipline and fasting and devoted to the services of thy husband thou shalt attain thy best desire, on my return, if this foremost of pious men lives then. Being thus accosted by Rama, Kusalya being distressed with the thought of separation from her son, spoke unto him with tears in her eyes the following words. O oh my darling! It is beyond my power to dissuade thee from thy firm resolution for going to the forest, it is impossible to avoid this hour of separation. Go thou my son, with an earnest heart, may thou fare well, my anxiety shall be removed on thy return. Attain shall I then great happiness, when thou, O great one, shalt return after satisfying your woes and making thyself freed of debts unto thy father. Incomprehensible is the action of destiny in this world, O my son, as it drives thee away unto the forest, O Raghava, neglecting my request. Do thou now repair, O mighty hero, and come back in peace, and console me with soul-soothing, tender words. O my darling, Shall that day ever come, when I shall see thee return from the forest, wearing bark and matted hair? With great earnestness, the worshipful one began to eye Rama, 
determined to go as an exile unto the forest, and spoke unto him auspicious words, and became desirous of performing benedictory ceremonies. Section 25 Quisalia, subduing her sorrow, and touching holy water, began to perform auspicious ceremonies for Rama, and spoke unto him saying, Do thou, O best amongst the descendants of Raghu, repair now, as I cannot dissuade thee, but do thou return speedily and follow the footsteps of great ones. Let that virtue, O best of Raghavas, protect thee, which thou hast followed with gladness and self-discipline. Let the deities, whom you worship every day in the temple, together with the Maharshis protect thee in the forest. Let those weapons conferred upon thee by the great Viswamitra protect thee always, gifted with good qualities. Do thou of mighty hands live forever, being protected by the truth and merit of thy continual services to thy father and mothers. May the holy fuel, sacrificial grass, sanctified altars and courtyards, the sacred ground of medicant Brahmans, mountains, trees great and small, lakes, birds, serpents and lions protect thee. O best of men, may Siddhya, Vishwadeva, Manruta, the great ascetics, the sustainer, and he preserver of the creation Puza, Bhaga, Aryama, the Lokpalas, headed by Indra and others, the six seasons, the months, day, night, moments Shrutis, Smritis, and virtue protect thee, O my son, on all sides. May the great deity Skanda, Soma, Vrihaspati, Saptarshi, Narag, Moon and other ascetics protect thee. May the encircled regions with their lords, being pleased with my eulogy, protect thee, O my son, always in the forest. When shalt thou repair unto the wood, may the mountains, oceans, varuna, the heaven, sky, earth, air, things movable and immovable, planets and stars with their presiding deities, day, night, and evening protect thee. May the six seasons, months, years and all the divisions of time confer upon thee pleasure always, when thou of great intelligence shalt wander away into the forest in the attire of an ascetic. May the deities and demons ever minister unto thy happiness and may not fear proceed unto thee, O my son, from the terrible Rakshas and Pizachas intent on committing cruel deeds, and other animals living on flesh. May the apes, scorpions, wild gnats, reptiles and insects make thee no harm, may not the elephants, tigers, terrible looking bears, hogs, Buffaloes and other horned animals hurt thee. Being worshipped by me from here may the ferocious cannibal races of all kind bring thee no injury. May thy course be crowned with auspiciousness and thy powers with success. Do thou, O my son, repair unto the forest, being profusely provided with fruits, roots and other things. May all the creatures of the sky, all those who breathe on this earth, and all those deities who are hostile unto thee, contribute to thy welfare. May Sukrasoma, son, the lord of wealth and death, protect thee, O Rama, resorting to the forest of Dandaka. May fire, air, smoke and the mantras uttered by the rishis protect thee, O descendant of Raghu, at the time of thy bathing. May the lord of creation, Rishis and all the remaining deities defend thee when dwelling in the forest. That best of women Kuisalya, of great renown and having expansive eyes, after propitiating the celestials with garlands, fragrant odors and praises, began to offer oblations unto the fire by the, the help of eminent Brahmans for the welfare of Rama, collecting clarified butter, white garlands, religious fig trees and white mustard seeds for this purpose. The spiritual preceptor, 
after offering oblations unto the fire with due rites for his peace and health, presenting what was then left as offerings unto the lords of the four cardinal points and others, and giving the Brahmans a dish of curd, ghee and honey, made them utter benedictory prayers for Rama, who was going unto the forest. Then that renowned mother of Rama, after conferring upon the Brahmans Dakshinas, in accordance with their desires, accosted Raghava with the following words. May that blessing crown thee, which was attained by the thousand-eyed Indra, honored of all the deities on the occasion of killing the mighty Asura Vetra. May that blessing attend thee, which was involved in olden times by winter, for that king of birds Garuda, praying for nectar. Do thou attain that blessedness, for which Aditi prayed, on behalf of the wielder of thunderbolts intent on the discomfiture of the giants at the time of ransacking the ocean for nectar. May that prosperity wait upon thee, O Rama, which crowned the mighty Vishnu, while perambulating with his three steps, the heaven, earth and the regions, as a dwarf. May the rishis, the great oceans, islands, the three worlds, Vedas, the regions, lend their might in the advancement of thy welfare. Saying this, Kusalya, the foremost of all women, having expansive eyes, placed the grains on Rama's head, sprinkled his body with fragrant substances, and tied to his hands, as amulet, twigs of such auspicious plants as Visalya Krani, with due mental repetition of mantras. That excellent one of high renown, embracing Rama and smelling his head, with her voice choked, as if all pleased, though placed under the influence of dire distress in reality, uttered mantras and spoke unto him thus, O my son, O Rama, have thy desires attained and do thou go, wherever thou likest. I shall see thee, O my darling, with great delight, when shalt thou, returning Ayodhya in excellent health and having all thy ends satisfied, resume the administration of thy kingdom. Myself having sorrows removed and having my face glowing with joy, shall see thee coming from the forest like unto the rising of the full moon. Continually shall I eye thy good self, O my son sitting on an auspicious seat, and returning from the forest after making good thy father's behests. May thou returning from the forest and being dressed with royal robes and ornaments, satisfy the desires of my daughter-in-law. Worshipped have I, deities headed by Shiva and others, the great ascetics, the jenny and the snakes, May they all and the four cardinal points, or Raghava, contribute to thy welfare, who art going unto the forest for a long time. Kusalya, having her eyes full of tears, and performing the benedictory ceremonies with due rites, went round Raghava with solemnity, and seeing him again and again sighed hot and hard. Being gone round by his mother thus, Raghava, of great fame, and resplendent with the splendor of beauty, proceeded towards the abode of Sita, after bowing down unto the feet of his mother repeatedly. Section 26 Rama, intent on repairing unto the forest, and treading in pious tracks, after duly saluting Kusalya and beautifying the royal road, crowded with people, captivated their hearts by means of his high accomplishments. Whether he, ever engaged in ascetic rites, did not hear of all these affairs, there was in her heart only the thought of Rama's installation. That daughter of the king, after offering her service unto the deities according to the proper royal rites, was eagerly awaiting the approach of Rama with a grateful and pleased heart. Entered Rama this beautiful abode, excellently furnished and filled with people highly delighted, having his head hanging down a little with shame. Sita, seeing her husband, racked with sorrow and troubled in mind with anxiety, 
rose up trembling from her seat. Seeing her, that virtuous soul Raghava, could not bear his internal sorrow, which manifested itself by external signs. Finding him with face pale and perspiring, and incapable of containing grief within, Sita so distressed with sorrow addressed him, saying, O my Lord, why do I perceive such a change in thee? Today the constellation Pushya is in conjunction with the moon, and planet Vrihaspati is presiding over this conjunction. This day has been declared as the most auspicious one by the learned Brahmans, then why do thou cherish such a sorrow in thy mind? Why has not thy charming face been placed under the shade of an umbrella, having hundred ribs and white as a watery foam? Why do not the servants fan thee, having eyes like lotus petals, with choris white as the moon or a goose? I do not see thee, O best of men, eulogized with auspicious songs by the panegyrists, encomiasts and family bards. Why do not the Brahmans, worst in the Vedas, observing the formal rites, sprinkle on thy head, honey and curd, after washing it duly? Why are not thy subjects, citizens, urbans, and leading members of society dressed and adorned, willing to follow thee? Why does not that excellent sport chariot go before thee, having four fast-going steeds, adorned with golden ornaments tied unto it? Why does not that excellent elephant precede thee, O great hero, which is gifted with auspicious marks and resembles a mass of dark clouds and a mighty hill? Why do not the servants run before thee, O mighty hero, with a pretty-looking royal seat embroidered with gold? Why do I perceive thy face so pale as never seen before, and why therein is no mark of gladness, when everything for thy installation has been made ready. Vayupon spoke unto that weeping Sita, the descendant of Raghudas, O Sita, O thou born of a great family, worst in the knowledge of religion and intent on the performance of religious rites, my father has banished me unto the forest. Do thou hear, O daughter of Janka, how has this calamity befallen me? In the days of yore was granted unto my mother, Kakei two boons by my father, King Dasratha of truthful woes. When everything was made ready by my father for my installation, Kakei reminded him of his promise and gained over him for his righteousness. I shall live in the forest of Dandaka for fourteen years and Bharata shall be installed by my father as the heir apparent of the throne and myself bound to fly as an exile unto the wood, have come here to see thee, do thou not praise me ever before Bharata. Those who are crowned with prosperity cannot bear another's praise, it therefore behoves thee not to extol my virtues in the presence of Bharata. Thou shouldst not extol me even in the company of thy friends, thou shalt be then able to live with Bharata as one favorable to his party. The monarch has granted him this lasting heir apparentship, it is therefore proper for thee, O Sita, to please him specially for he is the king now. Today shall I repair unto the forest for redeeming my father's woes, do thou, O high-minded one, live here in undisturbed mind. Do thou, O sinless and auspicious one, live here engaged in religious rites and fasts, when I shall wend my way unto the forest inhabited by the great ascetics. Rising from the bed early in the morning, adore the deities every day, and then bow down unto the feet of my father Dasratha, the lord of men. My mother Kusalya is old and much pressed down with sorrow, do thou show proper respects unto her, considering it to be a pious deed. Thou shouldst then bow down unto my other mothers who all minister unto me, with equal love and affection. Shouldst thou specially regard Bharata and Satrugna like unto thy sons or brothers, who are dearer unto me than my life itself. Thou shouldst not do, O Vadehi, 
any such thing as might be unpleasant unto Bharata, for he is the king of the land as well as of the family. The monarchs are always propitiated by being served with assiduity and good temper. They are offended when anything contrary to it happens. They renounce even their own son, born of their loins, when they find him bringing about their mischief, and admit into their favor, persons devoted to their welfare, bearing no relationship whatever. It therefore behoves thee, O auspicious one, to live here, abiding by Bharata's commands and being engaged in religious rites and truthful woes. I am going unto the forest, O my darling, and thou shalt live here. O excellent lady, abide by my word as didst thou, never formally falsify it. Section 27 Being addressed thus, Vadehi, beloved and sweet speech, spoke unto her husband the following words, offended, as it were on account of her great affection. Is it that thou speakest me thus, thinking me, no doubt, me-minded? I cannot but laugh at thy words, O best of men, what thou hast said is not becoming of a mighty prince versed in military arts and is really very opprobrious and infamous. What more, it is not proper even to hear them. O dear husband, father, mother, son, brother, daughter-in-law, all of them abide by the consequences of their own actions, it is the wife alone, O best of men, that shares the fate of her husband, it is therefore that ever along with thee I have been ordered to live in the forest. Neither father, mother, son, friends, nor her own self is the stay of a woman in this, or in after life, it is the husband alone that is her only support. If dost thou repair today unto the forest impregnable, I shall go before thee, O Raghava, treading upon the thorns and prickly grass. Confident do thou take me with thee, O great hero, renouncing jealousy and indignation, like unto water left after drinking, there exists no sin in me that could justify forsaking. Unto woman is preferable under all circumstances the shade of her husband's feet to the tops of a palace, the celestial car or excursion in the airy path. I have been taught by my father and mother to follow my husband in all conditions of life, and I shall carry out now what I have been taught, I shall not abide by any other counsel. I shall wend my way unto the forest impassable, devoid of men, inhabited by various deers, tigers and other voracious animals. Happily shall I live there as if in my paternal house, giving no thought upon the prosperity of the three worlds, thinking only of the services that are to be rendered unto my husband. I shall sport with thee, O great hero, in that forest impregnated with the fragrance of flowers, tending thee constantly, having my senses subdued, and being engaged in austere performances. O great hero, capable art thou to maintain many thousand others in the forest, what of me? Surely shall I go today to the forest with thee, there is no doubt about it and thou shalt not be able, O great hero, to dissuade me from so doing. Undoubtedly I shall always live upon roots and fruits, living with thee always I shall not bring about thy affliction. Always I shall precede thee when walking, and shall take my repast after thou hast taken it. Willing am I to view mountains, rivulets, lakes and ponds. Being fearless in thy company, O my intelligent husband and great hero, I shall behold on all sides ponds filled with wild geese and ducks and beautified with a collection of full-blown lotuses, and shall bathe there every day, pursuing the same vow with thee. And greatly gratified, I shall, O thou having expansive eyes, amuse there with thee, in this manner, even for hundred or thousand years. I shall never experience the rivers of fortune, 
Inasmuch as I do not like to live in the abode of celestials, or Raghava, if I am to dwell there without thee, no, it is not pleasing unto me, O best of men. I shall go there in that dense forest full of deers, monkeys and elephants and live there as if under my paternal roof cleaving unto thy feet and abiding in thy pleasure. Do thou accept my entreaty whose heart is entirely thine, knows none else, and is ever attached unto thee, and who am resolved to die if forsaken by thee. Thus repairing I shall be in no way a burden unto thee. That best of men, reluctant to take Sita with him, who had spoken thus and who was greatly attached to virtue, related unto her about the many miseries consequent upon dwelling in the forest, with a view to prevent her from following him. Section 28 That lover of virtue, thinking of the miseries of the forest, resolved not to take Sita with him, who was versed in religious laws and had spoken thus, and consoling her whose eyes were stained with tears, that virtuous soul once spoke unto her the following words with a view to prevent her from going. O Sita, thou art born of an illustrious family and ever intent on the performance of religious deeds. Do thou practice virtue here as it may conduce to the happiness of my mind. O Sita, O thou of the weaker sex, do thou act up to my counsels, there are evils enough in the forest, do thou learn them from me who am about to dwell in it. Renounce therefore, O Sita, thy intention of flying as an exile unto the forest, which for its impenetrableness is said to abound in evils. It is for thy welfare that I give utterance to these words, happiness there is none, it is always covered with miseries. The roarings of the lions living in the caves of mountains, swelling with the sounds of the waterfalls, produce a very painful impression upon the ears, so the wood is full of misery. Animals, all maddened, sporting in solitude, seeing man, approach to attack him, so the wood is full of misery. The rivers are full of crocodiles, sharks, and other fearful animals, muddy and impassable and always infested with infuriated elephants, so the wood is full of misery. There the wayfarers are covered with creepers and thorns, they are void of drinking water, ever resounded with the noise of the wild fowls, so the wood is full of misery. Being exhausted with the toil of the day, the dwellers of the wood have to sleep in night on the bed made of leaves fallen from the trees on the surface of the ground, so the wood is full of misery. With the supply of fruits that have fallen from the trees, man of self-discipline must content himself morning and evening, so the wood, O Sita, is full of misery. One has to fast, O Matli, according to his might, to wear matted hair and bark, to adore the deities and his ancestors according to due rites, every day to serve the guests that come to him, and observing the rules of asceticism, to bathe every day thrice, namely, in the morning, in the midday and in the evening, so the wood is full of misery. One has to offer presents of flowers collected by his own self unto the altars, O Sita, according to the rites of the ascetics, so the wood is full of misery. Those that dwell in the forest will have to remain content, having practiced moderation in food, O Methili, with whatever edibles are attainable in the forest, so the wood is full of misery. There are always violent winds, darkness, hunger, and great fear, so the wood is full of misery. Reptiles, many and of various kinds, creep there on the path, O excellent lady, with haughtiness, so the wood is full of misery. And snakes living in the rivers and of crooked course like them, always await the wayfarers, hindering the passers-by, so the wood is full of misery. Birds, scorpions, insects, mosquitoes and wild gnats, always disturb the dwellers, 
O fair one of the weaker sex, so the wood is full of misery. There are trees full of thorns, having their branches moving to and fro, and the kusa and kasa grasses with thorny blades constantly undulating, so the wood is full of misery. There are various physical afflictions and diverse fears and great misery consequent upon living in the forest. Anger and desires are to be renounced, the heart is to be set on ascetic austerities, fear in the fearful objects is to be cast off, so the wood is full of misery. Thou shouldst not therefore go unto the forest, it forebodes no good unto thee. Weighing well, have I concluded that the forest abounds in innumerable evils. While the high soul Brahma, resolved thus not to take Sita with him unto the forest. She, greatly sorry, did not accept his words and spoke unto him in the following way. If you enjoyed this audiobook, Please like and subscribe to be notified of when new audiobooks are uploaded. Thank you for listening and learning. Shanti.